All right. Well, I'm super excited today to explore evolution with my buddy and Czech Institute instructor, Matthew Walden. As I'm sure you heard in the introduction, he's a naturopathic physician, osteopathic physician, highly skilled clinician, someone I really enjoy hanging out with and talking to and sharing with because he's one of the most intelligent people I know. And we have a lot of fun discussing everything from fossils to God to life and society and people and health problems and you name it. We talk about it and we explore it. So, uh, Matthew, what a great opportunity to explore evolution with you. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me, Paul. Really looking forward to it. So, Matthew, can you give us a, a just an overview of your training and your interests in evolution so that our listeners have a sense of where your perspectives may have may be rooted? Yeah, sure. So um, my uh, formal sort of professional training is as a, an osteopathist, as you mentioned, and a naturopath. And during that training, um, I had several um, lecturers that were particularly interested in evolutionary principles and, and looked at uh, the human body through that lens. And I always found that particularly fascinating and relevant. And um, then, you know, as I moved into postgraduate life and I did a, a master's degree, I started to, to delve into it in more depth. And, um, you know, I was looking at hamstring strain in professional footballers, for example, and, and looking back through uh, evolutionary history. So why is it that the hamstrings are constantly getting injured in, in sports people? And could there be some ev evolutionary rationale for it? Um you know, and, and sure enough, I think there is. Um, but then digging into nutrition as well, you start to realize that, you know, everything in the field of nutrition only really sort of makes sense when you look at it from an evolutionary perspective. And right around that time, I saw you speaking. And uh, of course, you were talking about your primal patterns and um, yeah. you know, about how uh, we moved uh, and needed a certain movement repertoire in order to be able to function in primitive times. And, uh, and so that really uh, attracted me into uh, learning more about what you were teaching. And of course, then you were teaching a lot about nutrition and holistic approaches to, to health, which really resonated with my, my previous training. So that's where it all started, really. Um, and then, you know, since then, I've just maintained an active interest in it through my writing and my teaching, um, and uh, obviously seeing where it's applicable clinically as well. Yes, and you know, as you alluded to there, in my, in my own explorations, which began very early in my career, I I always well, sort of the first thing that really made me interested was when I was young as an athlete. Uh, you know, starting at about twelve, I started lifting weights, and then um, one of my buddies, Robert Wallowina, um, I think when I was about. 18, he 18 or 19, he became Mr. Bo, uh, Mr. Canada in, in professional bodybuilding. And he owned a bodybuilding gym. And I started seeing that there was definitely differences between functional weightlifting and bodybuilding and saw, for example, that bodybuilders couldn't lift a lot of the weights that guys that did what I call functional weightlifting did. And because a lot of guys that body were bodybuilders were friends of mine, I would have experiences such as inviting them over to the farm. And I noticed right away that a lot of these guys that were strong and had big muscles weren't strong when it came to things like, well, one of my favorite hobbies for the, for the tough guys was I would take them into a pen with a, one of our rams called Geronimo, who was a a very powerful sheep. Uh, he was, uh, I don't know how much he weighed, but this guy was famous for ramming things and, yeah. you know, knocking gates right off their hinges. And uh -huh. my father, who was six foot four, 220 pounds, I saw him hit my father and send him flying like he'd been shot 20 feet forward. And uh, so we would, I would get in there as a kid just to entertain myself and I'd grab him by the horns and, and fight like hell to have him not throw me down and come at me, you know. But 
some of these guys could not handle him, you know, and, and I was a lot smaller than they were, but I, I could manhandle him. I, I could, if he would, he couldn't force me to let go of his horns. Yeah. And then things like lifting hay bales where we would be out lifting hay bales for hours at a time, guys with big muscles would lift three or four bales and then they'd sit there like they were exhausted, you know? Yeah. 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 Right. So I started you know, at, the, at an early age going, wait a minute, there's something going on here, which later led to my exploration of the concept that we must be created by the selective pressures of nature. We, we must have, you know, the bodies we do and the, and the uh, fast twitch, slow twitch organization and penation angles of muscles must all be there to serve needs that the environment imposes upon us. And then as I got into issues of diet, I started realizing that, man, was there just a lot of contradictions in the whole diet field, as you know. Yeah, yeah. And so I started looking into native diet issues and looking at the history of diet and the history of science as it was applied to diet. And I saw very clearly that diet was very driven again by environment and genes are driven by environment. Mm -hmm. So long story made short from the very beginning of my prep professional career, I was always interested in, you know, how are the challenges that we're facing today relevant to how we were designed to function and you start getting into things like ergonomics and see what p happens when people are in unnatural environments and it becomes uh, pretty obvious. Yeah. And then, as you know, I studied, I studied a lot with Vladimir Yonda and mm -hmm. Carol Levitt's. I sp spent a lot of time studying Carol Levitt's work and, and uh, spent time in the Czech Republic. And there's a fair bit of, of uh, conversation in the work of those elite doctors with regard to evolutionary issues such as adductor why do the adductors get excited when certain situations happen and all that so uh i think you know these are the things that were uh, prior to me and you meeting that led to yeah. a lot of my research and development <clears throat> and then of course the check totem poles all based on uh evolu evolutionary uh drives and reflexes that we developed to survive in nature yeah yeah, yeah. well and, and that, and i think you know that that was what really attracted me to your, to your work was that you know the i i had the realization that that uh an evolutionary context was so important and you know one of the things that that ties in with this is that some of the best biomechanical research that i've ever read is from anthropologists or biologically bi biological um uh was it evolutionary biologists um, right. and i think i think the reason being that they're looking for the function they're trying to understand the function of how our ancestors lived that's what they're they're interested in the, the lifestyles and and what they were doing and whether they were hunting or gathering or or whatever whereas i think the the biomechanics we tend to see clinically is very sterile it's very angular you know it's like it's like measuring angles measuring forces and it often doesn't have uh, as strong a correlation to the actual environment or the context within which it evolved to function. Um, but your your work does look at that, and so that I think was what drew me into, um, you know, all the training that I did with you. Well, you know, it, saying that reminds me uh, of something I know you'll appreciate. You know, I've got, as you know, a library that's pretty comprehensive and lots of books on biomechanics. And when you start looking at biomechanical studies, you see almost all the models are depicted as stick figures. So you've got yeah. some computer generated idea instead of a, a, a spine with, you know, 20 some odd vertebra, you've got uh, a, a line and, mm. and the uh, way these things are measured, of course, the context by which you design a study really uh, determines what the parameters of what you can learn from the study are. Yeah. And I was looking through all this biomechanical research. And for example, a lot of biomechanical research looking at things like weightlifting for low back injuries said over and over again that it doesn't help uh, strengthening conditioning or, or exercise uh, doesn't help back uh, rehabilitation. And I, I mean, I, I used to have piles of these studies on my desk and I'm like, 
this is just absolute bullshit. They're, mm -hmm. they're, these guys are missing the mark so bad. So, you know, these are some of the things. And unfortunately, a lot of people that are overly academic but don't have any experience uh, fall into the trap of believing what they read as though it was gospel. Yeah. And and, and a good example of, of the kind of illusion of research is look how popular all the ultra thick padded Nike Air Maxes and running shoes got. Mm -hmm. And and then uh, – you know, it wasn't until was it's born to run the the book that yeah, kind of that's right. yeah. it wasn't until that book was published people finally woke up and started changing their mind. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And that was the, that was another thing, obviously that that uh, tied in with my my evolutionary understanding was and, and again, you know, hearing it from you, hearing it from some of these guys at, at college was the idea that we should be barefoot, that we evolved to be barefoot, that our feet uh, get lazy when they're overly supported, overly cushioned, etc. And that all made perfect sense to me. And uh, and you know, sure enough, then when these minimalist shoes started to come out, and I, th I think this is kind of an interesting point, is that until there's a market draw for something, then it's not taken seriously. So I think, you know, like you were talking about barefoot back in the late 90s, at least, when I first yeah. heard you speak. And same with this other guy, Phil Beach, who, who uh, was talking about, you know, he used to go running barefoot. And of course, people thought it was completely crazy. And um, But, you know, it's only sort of 10, 15 years after that when actually there's a commercial um reality to it and and you start to get money behind it and then research studies start to come out and and now it's considered that actually this is this is a very functional way to work and in fact probably the best way to to to, to move is to be barefoot uh, of course there's still you know sort of contradictions to that but you know on your point to cushion shoes um as far back as 1984 nike knew that the more cushioned a shoe was the harder you would strike the ground and um and they had that there in all of their sort of biomechanics research and you know if you think about that from a um uh, a neurological perspective well you know the the role of the nervous system is to tell you where you're at in space that's one of the key roles of the nervous system that's your eyes are telling you where you're at you're not about to fall down a hole or walk into a wall or and your yeah. ears are you know giving you the balance and your your sensory awareness, particularly from your feet, is telling you what the terrain is that you're you're walking over or running over. So if you can't feel the terrain because it's too soft, your nervous system will make you hit it harder until you find that stability. And Nike knew that since the mid '80s, like I say, '84 it was. Um, and so anyway, so gradually, obviously, you see Nike brought out their free trainers, and then you had all the Vibrams and the other minimalist brands that came out with their, their shoes. And then that was popular for a while. And then the media kind of swung against it and decided that actually, no, you know, we're moving to a new trend now. And it was maximalism. And, um, and I don't think it's been, I was gonna say, I don't think it's been as big. I, th I know financially it's been equally as big, if not bigger than minimalist shoes, but uh, I don't think it's gained as much media traction because it's not as controversial, but, but the idea at the moment is that you double up the thickness of the of the uh, cushioning, and there was a really interesting study that came out recently from from one of these uh, researchers that that uh, has the sort of gate labs, and uh, she found that actually runners that are running in these maximalist shoes have even greater impact than runners that are running in running shoes, and of course those that are in running shoes have even greater impact than those that are running barefoot assuming you're running with with reasonable technique um but it's just you know it was just it actually broke her accelerometers it went beyond the level at which she could uh, measure it because um the impacts were so great with these maximalist shoes so it's completely contradictory completely sort of counter to what you'd expect um if, if you were to apply common sense you'd think something soft under your foot would make you hit the ground more softly but the reality is, is that no actually your nervous system has evolved to tell you where you're at in space and so therefore it will hit the ground harder until you can actually feel that firmness and that resistance yeah and then there's yeah. the issue of a proprioceptive lag um yeah. you know because the the more cushion the shoe the more um shall we say uh indefinite the nervous system sense of where you're at in space because the shoe's like a rocker board it can go in any direction yeah and considering the time it takes for a, an impulse to get say from your foot and your ankle to your brain to be processed and back down to your foot it's about uh three quarters of a second or 700 um 
milliseconds. And so, you know, I saw, you know, the, the Nike Air Maxes and all those shoes when they came out, I, I owned a physical therapy clinic and I used to giggle because like these shoes were making me a lot of money. And in fact, I, I learned the hard way because I remember the first time I got a pair of Nike Air Maxes within about the first two weeks wearing them, I sprained my ankle quite bad three times running on trails. Wow. And it was like, I'd been running for years without spraining my ankles and going out and doing steep hill runs and was part of a runner's group where they were just crazy guys almost doing like the, uh, I don't know what they call it now, where you just free fall down hills as fast as you yeah, can go. Yeah, like free running, yeah. Yeah, so we were doing all that and I'd never had any problems. And all of a sudden, I'm just running on, you know, local flat, largely flat trails and I just rolling my ankle. And it's like, what mm. the hell is going on with these shoes? Yeah. And so that's, I started looking into it and, and, um, realized, okay, this is an issue of a proprioceptive lag. It's, you know, mm -hmm. and I tell people mm -hmm. it's like making love through five sheets. You can do it, yeah. but it's, 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 uh, you certainly don't really get much of a sense of contact with your lover. <laughs> well, one of the phrases that, um, one of our competitor, cause I, I was, I don't think we've mentioned on this, this podcast so far, but I was involved with distributing the Vibram Five Fingers in the UK right. as part of that yeah. whole discussion. Um, but one of our competitors, Vivo Barefoot, they, uh, they had uh, a line which was that um, you know wearing um, the the Nike Freeze, um, which were the ones which basically were Nike's version of a minimalist shoe, but they were still quite there's still quite a lot of cushioning in them. And uh, they said, well, the Freeze are a little bit like wearing a, an extra thick condom because it, essentially you can't feel anything when you're wearing them, um, but with a hole in it because they still don't work anyway, because essentially you carry on heel striking and you carry on getting these huge impacts. Whereas when you ha don't have any cushioning, you stop heel striking in, in most cases, which means that you, you hit the ground a lot more lightly and, uh, and, and then you don't get the impact forces, which have been shown to be injurious and contributing to things like stress fractures and compartment syndromes and so on. So, um, so yeah, <laughs> very so, similar to your analogy. <laughs> so ultimately what's happening is people are paying a lot of money for a thick condom that doesn't allow you to enjoy sex, but you are forced to take responsibility for the outcome. <laughs> <laughs> called, <laughs> called now you've got a, a 30 year responsibility and, 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 and uh, from the physical perspective, it means you have to take care of the stress fractures, the ankle sprains, the knee injuries, dot, dot, yeah. dot. Yet, yeah. you know, the technology makes it worth money, right? All this yeah, boils yeah, yeah, down yeah. to it boils down to people telling whatever story they got to tell to get you to buy something, and and unfortunately, most people don't really look past marketing and they believe it as though it's actual solid science. But it's usually, um, you know, what would we call that? Uh, 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 a, a story manufactured to fit the construct of the social mind. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, and that brings up, you know, two two thoughts for me. The first was that um, we had a sales rep that worked for us to distribute the Five Fingers, and he had worked with Nike and um, Asics as well uh, when they when they had their gel systems first released and their air systems. And he was saying that what was really interesting about those systems was that they were incredible technology, and he saw all of the background to it and the amount of money, the millions and millions of dollars that were spent on the development. And he said, you know, that you could drop an egg from a height of six foot onto the um, ASICS gel system and it wouldn't, it wouldn't fracture a raw egg, you know? And um, uh, so he said incredible sort of shock absorption. And then the, the, the Nike air system returned energy to, you know, for, to increase the spring on your next step. Right. And he said, again, really good technology, really clever, but he said they spent millions and millions of dollars trying to solve a problem that the shoe caused in the first instance. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so it's just it's just hilarious, and uh, it was so that was a really astute observation from him. Um, but the other the other thing I, I think is a kind of bigger um, thought around this, um, and it's a lovely illustration is that you know when we talk about evolution, we're talking about phylogeny, we're talking about the evolution of species. Yeah. Um, and, and so th so that's essentially the definition of, of phylogeny or phylogenic uh, discussions. Then you've got the ontogeny, which is the evolution or the development of the individual. And mm -hmm. this is this is where uh, the minimalist idea, and perhaps also to some degree where paleo has come a little bit unstuck, is that the concept of phylogeny or the you know looking back to evolution to inform how we should move or how we should eat or how we should live is a rock solid idea. The challenge to us is that we haven't grown up or we haven't as individuals um, uh, developed to 
handle some of those stresses. So, and, you know, barefoot running would be a good example that, right. you know, if, if you've grown up wearing cushion supportive shoes your whole life, um, then there, there is an imbalance. And I had a slide, which was, um, which I used to present from time to time, which was like a, a tightrope walker holding a kind of, uh, you know, a, a bar. And on one side, you've got evolution or, or phylogeny, the sort of general evolution. And on the other side, you've got your own development, which is the ontogeny. And so we've got this kind of balancing act between evolutionary processes and of course, we've got, let's say, I mean, you could say that organisms have evolved for 400 million years because that's how long uh, land animals have been around. So the foot as a, as a structure has been evolving for 400 million years. Obviously, the human foot or the hominid foot, maybe 4 million. But but the point is you've got a huge weight on that side. And then you've got your own individual development on the other side. So if you happen to grow up in an environment where you were barefoot a lot of the time, um, and so, you know, in South Africa, for example, a lot of the, the people there will be uh, barefoot. It's just the climate. It's culturally acceptable. Um, and so, you know, no, no problem. So they, they grow up and they develop the skill, they develop the strength, and they develop the awareness to walk around barefoot and to run around barefoot and to not injure themselves because that's you know how we're evolved to move but if someone who's grown up in england or in germany or in north america and has worn shoes all their life suddenly hears this idea oh it's good to go barefoot and they jump straight into that that barefoot lifestyle or barefoot running then there's a potential risk there that they're not um uh, conditioned well enough or they haven't actually developed the kind of vocabulary to and i, and I mean that you know obviously in a kind of um metaphorical sense but it's it is a, a useful sense for anyone that's interested in uh going barefoot or minimalist with their footwear is is the idea that um you know if you're walking down a path or running down a path that's a bit sort of um uh rough there might be stones or sticks or roots that kind of thing well with each footfall you are asking a question of the path you're asking with your foot you know are you going to take me into pronation into supination are you inclined one way or the other are you sharp are you slippy are you slidey are you dry etc cetera, etc cetera, rough yeah and then your nervous system needs to be able to respond to that so so essentially you're asking the question you have to provide a response and someone who's grown up barefoot has a spot on a1 fluent vocabulary of barefooting but someone who's grown up wearing shoes is like it's like going to a foreign country and they don't know how to navigate that environment and it will take a while to become fluent so you know i think that ontogeny versus phylogeny discussion is is quite an important one when we're talking about how we apply evolutionary principles in real life you know yeah, I, I don't know if you've heard me use the term, but I've used it many times. I call it motor vocabulary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Because, you know, you, today, you know, um, years ago, I listened to a, a, a radio show that a guy that was a friend of mine named Don Bodenbach used to have all about health. And he interviewed a guy named Michael Mogadon, who uh, had a, a master's degree in public health and worked in public health. And he cited research uh, that looked into how much exercise people in the public in general do. And he showed that uh, 98, if I remember right, 98% of women and 96% of m men uh, never did any more exercise on a day. Uh, let's see, what was it? It was like they, they nobody did any exercise uh I think it might have been they only exercised, did something one or twice a week that was including walking a dog. Right. And I, I don't remember the exact, but it was a shocking statistic and showed that the public is highly sedentary when it comes to physical movement. Mm -hmm. And um, so you're, we're, we're, we're dealing um, with people like clinically, you know, this is why you ask someone to do a squat and they can't even squat. They can't. Yeah. And so when I look at them through the eyes of primal patterns, I mean, it was very, very common clinically for, for a, a patient to fail every primal pattern. They, they, and, and, and look how many people injure their backs getting in and out of chairs or in and out of cars, which compared yeah. to living in nature would be nothing. So yeah, yeah, that's how I developed my primal pattern standard and said, ideally, you should be able to do each of the primal patterns approximately a hundred repetitions at body weight just to have a fit enough body to be able to go for a hike in the woods or 
go work in your backyard and have enough fitness that you're you're probably capable of handling kind of typical daily environmental stress factors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's that's why that primal pattern system that you developed is so clever because it is providing um the basic motor vocabulary that you need to get by isn't it and um yeah uh like you say most people can't achieve those with optimal form uh, on the first time through and so they need the coaching and they need sometimes to isolate things down and then build back up and reintegrate but but the point is that there's a standard that we should be able to achieve just to be functional animals in within our environment and um so your primal patterns concept resonated quite closely with some other concepts I'd read around, which were um, uh, Phil Beach's concept of archetypal rest postures uh, and Michael Tetley's concept of instinctive sleep postures. And whilst those ideas were similar in nature in as much as they were looking to how we rested, of course, they are more sedentary by their by their nature yeah and the primal pattern's more active and so you know the primal pattern's obviously going to have a, a greater influence on the underlying mechanics and on the neurophysiological um components of live living uh, and of life you know because you to, to move is is uh to keep everything flowing isn't it it's to keep the, yeah. the blood flowing the lymphatics flowing to keep the nervous system stimulated and so on but i think these other concepts are quite useful because the idea with those is that, you know, if you are uh, sleeping and you have a pillow, well, the, the pillow is, is using, you're using that as a prop, whereas normally you, in nature, if you watch the great apes or indigenous people, they use their arms as a pillow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what that does is it maintains full range of motion at the shoulder because to get your arm up fully abducted or fully flexed if you're prone um, is – you know, is, is, is essentially is, is maintaining the range of motion there. And we can easily lose the range of motion in our arms, for example, because who puts their arm above their heads uh, regularly, you know, to, to full 180, unless you're using it specifically for your work um, or perhaps for a sport, if you're in a sport that, that, that involves that. But otherwise, I mean, maybe you might say to get dressed, but you can get around getting dressed uh, without putting your arm to 180 degrees. So, so the point is that to sleep with your arm up like that or to sleep prone with your head turned, for example, maintains the range of motion in the neck. Yeah. And, you know, for many years and even still now, a lot of um, manual therapists, physical therapists will say you must never sleep on your tummy, really bad for your neck because it twists it. And you <laughs> think, well, <laughs> this, is, this is a bit of a flawed view because, <laughs> you know, that's, it's, it's such a biomechanically focused view and it completely ignores the fact that there's a nervous system there that yeah. is – whilst you're asleep it's, it's still in in control telling the, the 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 joints and the muscles what to do so and you the, know after yeah it's well, telling the body when to move yeah absolutely and so you know i think if you were to lay on your tummy uh with your head turned then this is what i wrote about in in uh, my chapter that I, I wrote for leon chato's uh, naturopathic physical medicine book um is that you know, connective tissues will undergo creep, which is a form of stretch, of course. And yeah. as they do that, the mechanoreceptors or sensory receptors within those connective tissues will start to send drives into the nervous system. And those drives will essentially switch on the muscles to tell you to move. So you can do that whilst you're completely asleep. Um, uh, and your body does do that because the research into sleep postures shows that you move between 40 to 70 times per night. So a lot of people think they have a favored sleep posture and that they can only sleep on their back. But the reality is that, that maybe they go to sleep on their back. That's the, the, the position they find easiest to fall asleep in. But if you train a camera on them overnight, they'll, they'll move 40 to 70 times. And those movements it's my belief and understanding that they are driven by uh, nerve firing from the various connective tissues that are stimulating the muscles to engage and to, to move you into a new position. Um, so, so anyway, so the, you know, the, these rest postures I, I think are important and to have an understanding of, of how the body can rest without a seat, how it can sleep in a bed without a pillow. That's all going to be um, healthful for, for people's biomechanics. Um, but you know, one other thing you're talking about there where you, you talking about motor vocabulary, um, or, or, or it prompted me to think of this at least is that, um, one of the things that you, you teach within the system, or we teach within the system is, is, um, sensory motor amnesia. Right. Um, and, uh, this notion, which is, you know, completely verified. I think originally when it came out, it was Thomas Hanna, wasn't it? That talked about that. Um, I think I, he was the first person that I, uh, saw 
speak of it from, you know, in a book. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, Yonda and others, for example, there's like the test where you uh, have somebody uh, and this, this is, a, I'm sure you've done this one before, but it's very interesting when you do it. Mm. Um, I used to have, as you could imagine, truckloads of low back pain patients. And one of the tests that I gained out of um, just reading lots of literature, I don't remember where now because it's been many years, but simply ask a person to stand up, close their eyes and say, now tip your pelvis forward and backward. And the number of people that didn't know what direction forward was, was huge. And the number of people that um, couldn't, I'd have to tell them or touch them so they could tell which forward and backward was. Well, wow. But I was shocked at how many people, when I asked them to tip their pelvis backward, would tip it forward, even though they just tipped it forward previously. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say, tip your pelvis forward. They would tip it forward. I would say, tip your pelvis backward. Pretend your pelvis is a big bowl full of water. I want you to pour the water over the back across your belt. So it runs down the back of your legs and they would tip their pelvis forward. And I would try several times. And I found, I would say probably 50% at least of my low back pain patients could not with their eyes closed, differentiate tipping their pelvis forward from backwards. And probably almost as many of them had almost no range of motion in posterior pelvic tilt. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean they might not have already been posteriorly pelvic tilted, such as sure. disc injuries, but they had lost their ability to consciously, with their eyes closed, feel their body through sensory motor connection to move the pelvis. Therefore, they lost the ability, for those of you listening, yeah. am amnesia means I forgot. Mm. And so I, I started picking up all these little tests from studying various you know, literature from all over the world. And, and one of the things that I really saw is when you put people on a Swiss ball, they, they had terrible sense of body awareness and terrible balance, even with simple things like sitting, just, I'd ask people just to sit with what they, I'd say, just sit with good posture. And, and they had no idea that their head was like way forward or their shoulders were rounded or their thoracic spine was in a, uh, you know, a, excessive kyphosis, not a natural curve, but drop down like chest down. And so, you know, this, this is like, you know, I'm talking like when I'm, you know, working in sports and orthopedic physical therapy. So 80, 1988. Right. And as you know, people are worse now by far than then. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think with the sensory motor amnesia, um, first of all, you know, that all, all the research into low back pain and spinal uh, injury since then has uh, one of the things that's remained consistent throughout the years is the fact that when you have pain you lose your awareness of, of joint position sense so so proprioception um so that leads into that so sensory motor amnesia that we're, we're talking about um but what i wanted to, to sort of drag in here was that you know i think it's a concept that you put together paul or that you described as enteric amnesia yeah um which obviously is this forgetting uh, what these messages are actually telling you from the guts uh -huh. um, or from the enteric nervous system. Yes. And, um, you know, this, I think, leads into the paleo kind of concept from the perspective that, you know, we've talked a bit about biomechanics, but we haven't uh, so much talked about nutrition and lifestyle. And um, I think that certainly my experience uh, with clients is that, Many, many people have inflamed digestive systems or inflamed uteruses or, you know, other issues in the abdominal cavity. Yes. And they just have no idea that certain foods make them bloat. I mean, they might say, yeah, you know, I feel a bit bloated. And there they are with a, a gut that's really hanging out over their belts. Yeah. Um, and you know that that is going to be painful. And in fact, I've even had patients that expressly tell me that, you know, they have no issues with their digestive system. And, um, and then I've said to them, well, look, you know, it shouldn't be painful. So if I just palpate onto your, um, let's say your large intestine or your small intestine and see how that feels to you, uh, let's, let's give that a go. And when you press in, yeah. then they're jumping off the treatment table, yes. um, you know, or, or you could ask them to lay 
face down over a Swiss ball. Sometimes that enough is enough pressure on the abdomen for them to realize, oh my God, that's really painful in there. But it's a great example of this enteric amnesia where I, I think, you know, if they were more in touch with their bodies, they would recognize that when they eat their gluten or their soya or whatever it is that, that's inflaming them, that straight away that creates bloating, it creates pain, and they would there, then change their diet. But it seems that our kind of ideas around food or uh, perhaps just our distraction from other things that are going on in our lives means that we don't pay attention to these things. Um, and, uh, and so we end up with a population, if you go down to the local swimming pool, then, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent of people there will have a belly that is protruding and swollen and, and essentially bloated. Um, so they almost certainly most of them will have enteric amnesia because they, they're not even aware that they're in pain. Well, I think there's two things, and I'll and then I'll jump us forward on, on to the, yeah. some of the other issues. But uh, two things I saw, well, three things. One, in 95, uh, what was it, 95? No, it was before 95. Well, whenever Richardson, Joel, hmm. uh, Hyde, uh, Richardson, Joel, uh, Hodges. Um, Hodges and Hyde, released uh what is it therapeutic exercise for low back pain yes yeah, segmental spinal stabilization right yeah what year did that come out 89 or something or 90 no it was a bit later it was it was 98 i think maybe 97 okay hmm. well but their but their research papers came out in the mid 90s so you probably yeah. saw some of them as well yeah so when i first got hip to using the blood pressure cuff and started uh, testing tva activation that for those of you that don't know tva transverse abdominis it's the muscle that's uh, the deepest muscle of the abdominal wall, it's shaped like a girdle. And when you draw your belly button and you're activating the transverse abdominis, which is a key spine stabilizer. And I found that whenever, whenever I had people that had any kind of inflammation in their guts and you pump the blood pressure cuff, a lot of them found it very uncomfortable. And I don't think any of them could activate their TVA when they had inflamed guts like that because the pressure was triggering off pain, which, as you know, produces inhibition in the motor system. Mm. And so that was one of my first realizations that the that a lot of people were probably giving us false negatives um, on the test. In other words, um, it depends how you want to look at it. False positives, yeah. if you want, because we're testing to see if they can activate it. But um, so I immediately thought, well, I have to check this without this invasive uh, blood pressure cuff, without the the bladder. So I would have them go on their hands and knees and just do a four point tummy vacuum, and I found a lot of them had no problem activating their transverse abdominis. But when you're in your four point position and your abdominal wall relaxes, it makes a lot more room for your organs. So you can, mm. uh, those people could draw their belly button in usually to the point where it started compressing inflamed tissue, then they would uh, have inhibition. Yeah. So, you know, but the, the other thing that, that I'm, I'm highlighting here with regard to why people are so unaware of their internal self, particularly the guts in this regard, is that one, they've been programmed by doctors to believe that you're guts have nothing to do with your back or your musculoskeletal system. And two, the medical system through uh, the, the drug system through the medical system has created a culture that simply drugs any pain out. So they actually never experience the pain long enough to learn anything from it. It's just like, oh, that hurts. I got to take a drug for that. So, yeah. you know, people basically block their ability to have a relationship with their bodies and so they actually just keep doing the same things over and over again until they're just completely and utterly broken. And mm -hmm. sometimes, as you know, it's too late. Like the number of athletes that have ruined themselves because they didn't have this, you know, basic training, like I share in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, is more than I can count. For, for every million that an athlete's made, probably 10 million has been lost by somebody being uneducated or trained or rehabilitated uh, very ineffectively. But yeah. we're talking about evolution. So I'm curious, what do you think an understanding or a better understanding of evolution would do or it, how, why is it important to the relevant fields of science that are directing the public and our views on things and people in general? In other words, how is having a better understanding of our own evolution 
important to all the key sciences, whether it be uh, physics, uh, cosmology, uh, medicine, orthopedics, biomechanics, um, you know, even science of mind, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 people in general. Um, uh, you know, how would how do you think people would be better off if science and all of us were more oriented to our past as a source of education? Well, I think um, I think. You know, there's there's a, a famous quote from a guy called Dobzhansky from, I think it was 1972, and he said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So I think from that that perspective, you know, obviously he's talking about biology, but I think this applies to physics, chemistry, uh, to society at large. So the whole sort of biopsychosocial uh, view that is very popular at the moment, the that that phrase makes perfect sense because what it does is it provides context. And again, this is something that we always talk about, uh, again, in pain neuroscience and in rehabilitation and when we're talking about people's beliefs and how that may be affecting them. The, the thing that's most important is to understand the context. And, um, and so evolution provides that context. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the big challenges that is in academia, what you find is that um, you know, people get so specialized in, in a given uh, discipline that what happens is that they, again, they, they, they will lose the context. And so this is where you end up seeing things like, um, I don't know, let's say genetically engineered foods or scientifically yeah. engineered protein powders or whatever. Um, and, you know, you, you, you've completely remove the context of where that food has come from and what it's designed to do. You've got so deep down a, a rabbit hole that you can prove to, you know, certain scientifically oriented readers and therefore scientifically oriented journalists um, that you should use this, let's say, whey protein powder. This is going to be the best way for you to grow muscles or to recover from training or whatever it is. Um and and it's taken completely out of context of of whether we actually evolved to eat whey protein that's been isolated and processed and then preserved and then stored on a shelf for a year and a half and then rehydrated. You know, it just so the the, the evolutionary concept provides the context, and I always think that it it's it cuts a path through a sea of confusion that's out there because this you could find we we're talking earlier about minimalist shoes or barefoot versus maximalist shoes you know and you can find research that would support either viewpoint but you then have to look and say well okay someone could tell me that if you put these springs on your feet uh you can run faster and and you know from scientific perspective maybe i can but is my physiology actually going to hold together if i do that let's take a look at how i evolved to function did i evolve to function with springs on my feet or did i evolve to run barefoot and you're like well, I evolved to run barefoot. So, so which way are you going to go with that? Uh, well, I think evolution always gives you, it points the direction for the way to go. Um, so I think that's, that's a sort of biological application of it. Um, from the other sciences, um, I'd say that there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, benefits in terms of looking at uh, the, again, the evolutionary context uh, for things like physics and chemistry as well um and you know what i suppose one of the one of the sort of bigger notions here is that the idea that uh, darwin put out and has been popularized by uh scientific materialism since then is this idea of survival of the fittest right um and that itself has obviously increased um or not increased but it's, it's created an, a, an environment within which competition is seen as the default mechanism or the, or the, again, the context, the backdrop for life. Whereas, you know, other theorists like Lamarck uh, as an example, um, took much more of a, a cooperative approach and said that actually, um, organisms are cooperating to create an environment within which, uh, the ecosystem can thrive. And so the Darwinian perspective has really, pushed a kind of both a, an economic and a political and a societal agenda which i think has caused a lot of the conflicts that we've seen 
over the last centuries or it's been it's been uh, a contributing factor at least to a lot of the conflicts that we've seen over the last couple of centuries um and you know also has has really directed the field of research into a competitive kind of landscape as opposed to a co- cooperative and more perhaps open-minded landscape and this um, is across the board too this isn't we're not just talking about uh exercise or health sciences we're talking about business we're talking yeah. about every facet of human relationships and you know you're, you're being very polite the competitive element of darwinism uh expends extends itself beyond competition to completely eliminating the opponent that's it yeah, you know yeah. and if, so we have genocide and and mm. all, all all sorts of these types of kind of odd interpretations through the lens of darwinism but um yeah, yeah. and the third the third right really used darwin's uh ideas to to promote uh, it's it's um ideologies of exterminating the, the the jews and like you say genocide it was it was the idea that uh, the aryan race was a superior race and so because it was the fittest race we should exterminate other races and you know that way we have a kind of eugenics program essentially that 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 creates a better future for the world and and that's a really as as you can see from from what happened that's an extremely dangerous route to go down um and um it's not reflective of reality which is why you know one of the one of the concepts that i've kind of stumbled across over the years is that if anything um if anything can transcend or or survive through time um then it points towards it being true you know or, or having having more truth than something that doesn't and so nazi germany is a great example of of an idea that seemed good to hitler and to his group and he managed to convince the german people of it and you know in other countries as well italy um austria and so on so and so they're all convinced of these ideas and then it turns out that it was not a good idea it was not the truth and ultimately history redirects itself um but so i'm just trying to think where i was going with that um well i think i think what you're saying is is that um the idea of darwinism and uh survival of the fittest uh, mm. ultimately didn't pan out to be true as evidenced by hitler and, yeah. and the and the second world war and and, That's and, it. And, and, it, and it, you see it in, in, in business as well. I mean, mm-hmm. I was sitting watching television last night. I was watching the finals of The Voice. And um, I'm always amazed at these drug commercials and commercials in general. And, you know, so basically we're, we're at this point now where due to this idea of the survival of the fittest that the larger corporations and it's even to the point now as you know it where we're now getting censorship of of public right to to sh- to speech with things like vaccinations and many other things where yeah. you know it seems like forever i'm having people that i know tell me their website has been shut down uh mm-hmm. sherry tenpennies they've tried to shut down her vaxter website and and uh right. and you know they it it it's appears to me that a lot of these um Various corporations hire hackers to just, you know, collapse websites that are competing with their opinion. So where I'm going with this is this this is to the extermination of any competitive idea. And I was saying to Angie on the couch last night, I said, do you realize the impact that large corporations are having through commercials alone? Because they're creating the illusion that the world is unsafe and that you can't get by without their product and that the only way you're going to heal from your diabetes is to take this drug or the, the, you know, the only option for you if you have this uh, cancer is this chemo or whatever. Yeah. And so because, you know, the average person's watching television, something like 4.7 hours a day, I mean, that is a lot of time exposed to some of the most expensive brainwashing that, that money can buy. Yeah. And so what happens is that there's an extermination of in the public of the idea of holistic health or the idea that my diet is involved in the creation of my disease and that I can manage this through natural means because they don't make money off of that. So it's yeah. you know 
so to, to kind of move forward into some of the other things I wanted to talk to you about, you know, when we look at the the kind of Darwinian approach and you start looking at, at uh, you know, all the sciences, whether it be archaeology, paleontology, um, biological anthropology, and, and the relevant uh, fields that look into, you know, the history of man and the evolution of man, hmm. um, you know, the, the one of the big problems that Darwin's theory has is it cannot account for these gaps in the fossil record where there's just significant jumps where one form of a species comes to an end and all of a sudden something wildly different pops up. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, so there, there's, there's the Lamarckian theory, which as you mentioned already, and then there's, uh, you know, science. My first exposure to a lot of this science was David Wilcox's book, The Source uh, field investigations where he mm. highlighted the uh, the you know mountains of science, a lot of it from Russia, yeah, showing how they could use laser beams and and various frequencies and vibrations and uh, any means of transferring information and take, for example, um, a chicken egg and transfer a laser beam through the chicken egg into a duck, and the duck would then hatch with the characteristics of both a duck and a chicken, such as having webbed feet. Uh, yeah, so you'd get yeah. a chicken with webbed feet and a flat bill. Mm -hmm. So based on what you've looked into, wh what do you, where do you feel we're at now with evolution? How, well, how, how, do, how do we explain all these? The, I mean, what, what do you feel is really going on based on your own observations and studies? And what's your opinion on these things? Sure. Well, uh, you know, I think one of the things that I was going to, move into on, on that previous discussion was was to say that you know we we can see that there's issues with darwinian evolution and sure enough what's happened is in the latter half of the 20th century what you start to see emerging is because it was you know darwinian evolution fits beautifully with genetic theory and with genetic understanding but but epigenetics which was a discipline which has actually been around quite a long time i think the term actually is like an 18th century term or not 18th century 1800s term yeah um so so it's it's been around a very long time but but it's only really been studied in a lot of depth probably in the last 20 30 years or so the, the real towards the end of the 20th century and of course one of the key proponents of it um is bruce lipton yeah and um you know he talks about this notion of the human genome and genetic determinism and the idea like you're saying about the adverts that you saw on tv last night the idea that essentially your fate is fixed by your genes and so you are this kind of weak uh and vulnerable individual that needs the help of big pharma your you know sort of uh i, I suppose godly kind of doctor to to come in and wave the magic wand give you the right pills and potions and they will be able to fix you um and i think that's such a, a disempowering and actually disingenuous approach to working with people uh particularly based on on the research that we we now understand and we know that the genes do not determine uh in the most the the, the, the biggest majority of cases the genes have very little impact on your susceptibility to disease um i know bruce lipson talks about between uh, one and five percent of of uh all diseases have a, a strong genetic component and the rest is really down to how you live your life and how you influence your genes through your life choices through your nutrition through your belief systems through how you manage your emotions through whether you exercise or not and so this is this is the whole thing about you know genotype versus phenotype in other words you know the, the hand of cards you've been dealt and then how you play the hand of cards. Yeah. Um, so just I'll interject real quickly. There's oh. a, an analogy that he gives that I think is lovely. Mm. Um, he says, imagine the genes like the keyboard on a piano and the yeah. environment as the musician playing the piano. Mm. Well, naturally, if you take a hammer and smash the keys, such as having an addiction to alcohol, that's like mm. smashing the keys. Well, then your genes are going to respond to that stressor whichever way they can and if you happen to have a, say a genetic weakness with the ability to detoxify alcohol well then you're probably going to get uh liver cancer and die but mm -hmm. if the guy living next door to you drinks just as much alcohol and and is different or more genetically endowed with detoxification and roger williams in his uh book um Jeez, what's roger williams book titled uh, Bio biochemical individuality yeah biochemical individuality he showed 
that within the same family, there can be a 1,000% difference in the ability to clear different toxins through our detoxification pathways. So even though they're coming from the same parents, there can be quite radical difference in, in the gene's ability to deal with these things. And, and it, you know, it's, it's gotten to the point now where so many people are buying into this. It's really frequent for me to get patients showing up who've had lab tests done on genes and they're now convinced that they have the fat gene and there's no way they'll ever get slim again or they have this right. gene and they're going to they're they're at high risk for cancer and they're all scared to death and you know I tell right. them look if you if you pour a milkshake into the keyboard on your piano it's probably going to really stick the keys together and make a mess because mm -hmm. the piano is not designed to interface with milkshakes and mm -hmm. if you don't learn how to pay attention to your own body and work with it and let it guide you, then you're going to keep pouring milkshakes and drugs and crap and you're mm. going to screw the keyboard up. And the gen all of us have genetic weak links and it's lifestyle that determines whether or not we manifest those weak links or not. Yeah. No, yeah. People, to the degree you think you have these genetic weaknesses from testing or mm. otherwise – or history, that's even more of a reason to manage the environment because that's what free will is. That's what choice is. That's your ability to, you know, some people just don't, their bodies don't like cold weather, you know, and mm -hmm. it's not that there's anything wrong with them. It's just the way they're designed. So sure. fine, wear a sweater, um, yeah, yeah. you know, eat more fat. But let's let your body guide you or you'll never know whether that you don't like cold weather because your adrenals are fatigued and you just have no resources left and you can't regulate your own thermoregulatory system or whether it's actually a genetic issue. So, mm. I, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of wild to see how quickly people fall hook, line and sinker for something written on paper just because it's written by some PhD or some scientist, and they don't think, they really don't think and pay attention to almost anything. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, when you talk about papers being written, uh, one of the, the fascinating things there is that, of course, a lot of the papers that do explore uh, things like the, the evolution of consciousness, they tend to get... Um, uh, rejected by journals and and held out of the limelight by uh, various scientific institutions and and, and uh, journal editors and so on so you know sometimes these concepts like like epigenetics for a while but now it's become sort of um irrefutable the evidence that's there but for quite a, a long time i remember you know when i first heard of bruce lipton it was probably 2003 or something and his book had come out a couple of years previously and you could tell from the way he spoke. I saw him speak at a couple of conferences and, of course, you know, looked him up on YouTube and so on. And you could tell that he was fighting what seemed at the time to be a losing battle. And then probably in the last five to ten years, you've seen actually a real flourishing of epigenetic research coming out from various institutions. But there was definitely a lot of resistance to the, to the notion of epigenetics because genetic determinism – fitted so well with the pre-existing paradigm of uh, essentially Newtonian physics and things that are determined in a clockwork like and that can't be influenced by emotions or feelings or consciousness or, or whatever. So um, it's, you know, it's been interesting to just witness that and also to see how that's reflected in the pre-existing uh, religious models that have really informed our society from particularly Western society you know, with, with the um, Abrahamic religions and the notion of an external God yes, and how that, that has then been reflected in the way we see the power being held in an external authority figure like a doctor or a surgeon or a, a pharmacist or a pharmaceutical company or indeed something we can't influence like genes that have just been handed to us by God and now we've got to suffer as the sinners that we are, you know, with, with the, the hand of cards that we've been dealt. And actually this, the, the reality of that situation is that that's just not true at all. Yes, of course there are genetic um, uh, diseases and genetic propensities, but the reality as, as Bruce Lipton and many others now have shown is, is that these things are dramatically influenceable through nutrition and lifestyle and thought management and emotional management and so on. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
well, it's, it's both exciting and frustrating at the same time because, you know, you can see that there's a lot of positivity for, for the future, but there's still a lot of resistance to that way of thinking. Well, there is. And, you know, um, just going back to what you were saying about the effects of, you know, kind of the the concepts of religion and, you yeah. know, they, they've been going at each other forever uh, in, in the survival of the fittest model. But mm. uh, the 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 medical doctor and the pharmacist and all the people wearing white coats, they, they have assumed the archetypal role of the priest yeah. and the unconscious um, perception is that they are the functional equivalent of the priest and therefore the emissary of God and that they are the ones that have access to divine knowledge and everybody else is, you know, has to go to the church to get that information and uh, you know it's it's always amazing because if we if we stick to that line of thinking, uh, right in the Bible, Jesus says, "Lift the stone, and I will be there. Split the wood, and I will be there." Meaning that mm. what what God is or consciousness is is everywhere in the stone, under the stone, in the wood. And it, yeah. it, I'm still to this very day baffled how people read religious books and paradoxically miss the greater truths but mm. fall in love and fight to the death over the lesser truths yeah. and you know this is another topic altogether so we don't want to get too far off of it but you know as joseph campbell says when people read religious documents like the bible as dictations instead of connotations they're in deep trouble mm. and you, you know we won't we don't need to expand on the depth of trouble that's created. But uh, what, what I really would be interested in, what, what do you think's going on with regard to the evolution of life, the evolution of uh, species, the evolution of planet, the evolution of yeah. man? I mean, if you just said, what's really going on here? Well, what does Matthew think about it after studying this stuff most of his life? Yeah, yeah. Well, it is it is fascinating. You know, you can look at the sort of religious uh, or, or um, intelligent design uh, concepts, and you can look at um, obviously the standard narrative. Um, some of the alternative theories, like the Lamarckian theory that we, we mentioned earlier, which is essentially very similar to Darwin's theory, but essentially it, it is saying that um, his proposal was that, and the, the example is often used as um, giraffes for the, for this concept is the, the idea that you can actually adapt within your own lifetime and that that adaptation will be passed on to your offspring and from a genetic perspective because of course this was pre uh pre a t pre the time where we really understood uh genetics um that seemed feasible and then with genetics coming in it seemed completely infeasible and actually got completely rejected and now with epigenetics coming in um people are starting to realize that Actually, no, this is entirely feasible and that Lamarck actually was probably onto something and that we do adapt within our own lifetime. So this comes back to the discussion we had earlier about phylogeny and ontogeny. So ontogenically within our own life, our own evolution as an individual, we can adapt. And that's through epigenetics. And so, you know, from that perspective, uh, I think that the Lamarckian view is something that is re-emerging and will continue to re-emerge as we understand more and more. Um, for a more sort of general overview, um, you know, one of the funny things about um, uh, science versus religion is is that um, uh, you know a number of commentators have, have uh, sort of commented on this and said that you know, in fact, Rupert Sheldrake is the person I can I can picture saying this is that um, you know science can explain absolutely everything about how we got here just so long as you allow them one miracle at the beginning, which is the Big Bang. Right, you know, yeah, something yeah. came from nothing. <laughs> but essentially, no one can explain it. And um, uh, there's this guy who you and I have, have uh, shared notes over, Donald Hoffman, who talks about it being consciousness all the way down. Yeah. And that consciousness essentially is what has... Um, <sighs> originated everything you know so and you know of course we can go into all kinds of different rabbit holes fr from that statement but his his um research is very very convincing because he uses game theory to look at how um if you were to take just a very rationalist view of evolution and um of course you know if we skip through all of the first few billion years of the universe and get to to life on earth 
then what he says is that if we're perceiving reality as it is, or if the earliest life forms were perceiving reality as it was, then they would die out quite quickly compared to an organism that was essentially hacking the system and finding shortcuts. So it was perceiving reality to give it an, a, a kind of life hack advantage. And the example he uses there is um, that there's a, a certain brown beetle in Australia that uh, actually has dimples on the back of its brown. It has, it has a dimpled hard shell to it. Um, and the female uh, is bigger than the male. And um, essentially, it's, in mating season, it will be found on the ground, often, you know, sort of uh, in the sandy banks alongside the, 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 the road and highways. And um, unfortunately, a lot of beer bottles also have that same brown dimpled appearance. And what happens is the male beetles are only programmed not, not to find the best female beetle, but to find the biggest uh, and brownest and dimpliest uh, thing it can find and then try and mate with it. And so what was happening was this species of beetle was going extinct. And so he's saying that's an example of a hack. So it doesn't actually know that it, whether it's a female or not. It just knows that it's got to find something that's brown, that's dimpled, and that's big. And the bigger, the better. And so what it was doing is it was selecting the bottles ahead of the female beetles, and the species was dying out. So he said that's a great example of, of, a, of a hack that's been built into the beetles because for the last however many hundred million years, that's worked perfectly well for them until humans came along and started discarding their beer bottles by the side of the road. So what you're saying um, is sex with beer bottles will halt evolution. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm saying. That's the message, the take-home message for today. Um, but, but so his, his point is that you can take any uh, number of different adaptations and the moment you build hacks into the system, like the hack that the beetle has, then what it does is it means that if you can compare something that has various kind of shortcut type hacks like, like that beetle example versus uh, an organism that's seeing reality exactly as it is, then the one with the hacks is always going to outshine and outgrow and outsurvive the one with, which is perceiving reality as it is. And this, well, is, this is using game theory. I missed the hack though. So the beetle that... So was, the hack is... Yeah, go on. Was it the hack that it realized that it could evolve quicker by humping things that were brown and dimply and big? Well, that's it. So, it, it you know, it, because there's been nothing else in its environment for however many million, I think, I think he said it's a couple of hundred million years. It might be, might be less than that. But he said for however long it was, it's just looked for, you know, come mating season, it knows it's got to find a female uh, or, or that's, that's what science would say, it's got to find a female. But it just knows it has to find something that is brown with dimples on it and the bigger the better. And so that's worked for it for, let's say, you know, 100 million years or whatever. But now that we've come along with our beer bottles, now that hack doesn't work and it doesn't know what a female beetle is. It just knows what a brown dimply thing is and the, the bigger the better and that's what it should try to mate with. So... so it, it, just just because I want to make sure everybody understands, because I know if I'm having a hard time putting it together, yeah, yeah. someone else might be. So you, you, you hinge this hack on the fact that if the organism was exposed to too much of reality, it would impair it in some way. So yeah. what was the too much reality that the beetle needed the hack for? Well, so what, what Hoffman says is, is that um, – if you, you know, the, the standard narrative for evolution is that the better your interpretation or the closer your sensory awareness is to what's actually going on. So in other words, if you've got really poor vision, right, um, uh, then you're more likely to get eaten by a lion. But if you've got really good vision, really accurate vision, and in fact, this is, this is true of humans. One of the things with human uh, visual evolution is that we know that we have exquisitely good color vision and we, th there's a whole sort of uh, barrage of, of evidence that it's to detect um, predatory snakes. Okay. Right. Uh -huh. So because our, our primate ancestors, the, the primary predator for our primate ancestors was predatory snakes. Mm -hmm. And so we, we've developed these modules within our vision to detect color and color that moves in serpentine kind of movement patterns. Um, and so this is why people will jump out of their seat if they see that kind of movement pattern. And mm -hmm. there's quite a few 
kind of amusing YouTube uh, videos of people essentially pranking people with fake snakes, doing that kind of thing. So, but the, the, the back to the point. So that's that's a hack. Um, and you know what Donald Hoffman has done with his team is he said, okay, so if you perceive, um, uh, let's say in this example, snakes perfectly accurately. Um, but you don't have the reaction, the, the hack to say something serpentine, um, then you will get eaten or you'll get bitten or you, you'll die out quicker than someone who, who doesn't have that hack. Um, because there's nothing inherently dangerous about a serpentine movement, let's say. Right. But we do know that snakes happen to, to, to coincide with that serpentine movement. And so we, we as humans have a hack to jump up and get away if there's something moving that's the right color that moving the right way um to to set off those trigger signals in our brain right but but it could be something that's completely innocuous like a grass snake for example right but we don't care we're just out of there right yeah um so so his game theories whenever they run the, the the game theory simulations what they find is that so long as you have the hacks built in you will outlast anything else and so from an evolutionary perspective what it's saying is that the likelihood that we are perceiving reality as it is is extremely low in fact it's almost certain that we're not perceiving reality close to what it is but we've got a whole bunch of different hacks that are built in so that we perceive things as dangerous that really aren't we perceive things as attractive that really shouldn't be or whatever um so but you know his his whole theory essentially shows that it's the consciousness that drives the evolution of the individual or, or the species as opposed to um the actual sort of hardware or the genetic coding so it's it's more of a behavioral driver than it is a um uh, a hardware driver so software is driving it as opposed to hardware so it would be that would be species specific though because like the consciousness of a snake will be different than the consciousness of a tree or an insect yeah. or an animal or a human one mm -hmm. of one of the things that popped into my head while i was asking you to explain the um too much reality as i was listening to you talk um yeah. you know having a fair bit of experience using psychedelics. And I know you have mm. some understanding of those uh, medicines as well. Yeah. I mean, you could, when you're, when you're on a psychedelic medicine, it disables the filtration system. So the ego kind of becomes porous and it's mm -hmm. very easy to conceive somebody who could be in a journey sitting right next to a rattlesnake, looking at it and just thinking it was some kind of a beautiful piece of art. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, and, and because there's so much information coming in, like if you were to double the amount of color, uh, the range of colors that a person could see, um, it might be too much information if, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, like yeah. too, too much, like you said, too much reality. Like if, if we, if we, a, a good way to perceive this is, I've had many people who go off and do shamanic journeys and they, mm. they, get, they get the ego filtration system damaged. And the, yeah. and the next thing you know, they're in a schizophrenic state where they're hearing all sorts of voices and seeing multiple visions, overlapping mm. visions, and they can't mm. tell what's real anymore, mm -hmm. which, which you could say is too much reality because they're, they're, it'd be like um, yeah. if you're watching television – and all of a sudden, your television starts picking up three channels at once. Tells at once, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't yeah. tell what you're watching anymore. So the hack would be to fine tune the reception to only the things that are necessary for perceived survival. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, one of the one, I remember one of the early concepts I picked up from uh, one of my my first evolution books. Um, I was trying to remember the name of it, but the the guy, the author was a guy called Cresswell. And um, what he said was that perhaps the most important evolutionary trait that we exhibit above all other animals is the ability to inhibit our reflexes and to inhibit our behaviors. Um, and so this inhibition seems to be really key in terms of 
um, creating our conscious experience because it seems like we can inhibit lots of information coming in from the environment. And when people use psychedelics or when they get into a deep meditative state, it seems like some of that inhibition is uh, released. And so you get a broader bandwidth, you see colors more deeply, you see more detail of the, you know, the, the insects that are on the bush outside. And you can, you can see this whole ecosystem actually sort of in action underneath your eyes, which normally you would just inhibit that out. You just see the bush, you label it and you walk past it. Yes. But, but, you know, like a child that has never seen a bush before and never seen, you know, a spider and the flies and the ants and the wasps and, and the, the bees and everything, you know, you're absolutely uh, spellbound by it, you know, because there it is. And you hadn't realized there was such a thriving ecosystem there on that single bush alone. And so, you know, I think that kind of relates to what you're, you're uh, pointing to there in terms of uh, this inhibition of, of uh, the senses and our sensory awareness or our bandwidth is typically decreased in normal waking consciousness. Um, but, you know, one of the theories on, on evolutionary development of the brain is that we went through a period um, probably uh, two, two to 6,000 years ago in that kind of spell where um, I believe that the, the, the term is that we had a binaural brain. So it's like we're listening from both hemispheres uh -huh. at the same time. And they, the, the theory there is that we, we're listening to our inner voice, but the ego still hadn't fully developed. And so we see the inner voice as something separate to us. Whereas, whereas in this day and age, we see our inner voice as, part, as probably the truest part of us. Like, you know, you, you might be sitting there thinking, now, what have I got to do today? What's my to-do list? And you're having a little conversation with yourself. Um, and that's perfectly normal. No one sees that as irrational. No one sees that as an angel talking to them. No one sees that as something bizarre in this day and age. But back then, as part of our development of um, cognitive function, the well, one of the, the theories is that we saw those that inner voice as perhaps being some kind of angelic voice or some kind of spirit that was talking to us from outside and giving us messages as to how we should go about our business or which which path to take or whatever. Well, that's, um, that, that um, level of consciousness is... Uh, considered magical consciousness in the you know research on the structure stages of consciousness and that's when um, natives didn't see themselves as separate from the trees or separate from the insects yeah. in other words we were all they everything was perceived to be as an extension of the self which is what the state a child is in you know for the first few years of its life and, yeah you know like yeah yeah uh, you know, one of the examples given is the reason a child will pee and poop all over the couch is because it doesn't see the couch as separate from itself. It just thinks that it's itself. And um, yeah. so the, the, the magical level of consciousness is where a lot of the, uh, you know, shamanic understanding came from. And I think it's also the level in our psyche where we actually – can communicate to plants and we can communicate to things like energy lines and feel things and gain mm. uh, information. When you start studying cultures like the Aboriginals and uh, any, mm. you know, almost any of the native cultures that lived in close contact with the land, and you even look at the art of people from Peru, and, and when you see people doing shamanic journeys and the art they do, it's very, very oriented to the magical level because as the psychedelic takes effect, it takes us deeper and deeper into a conscious awareness of these uh, what are normally unconscious psychic processes. And this is yeah. also why you hear uh, over and over again, if you study the research on psychedelics, that, that the shaman will explain that they learned how to make the medicine from the plants. Well, the modern you know, scientific materialist can't even grasp that concept at all mm. they they mm. think that's just horseshit but they yeah. don't realize that those people don't have such a well-developed ego structure that they've created a firewall from the yeah. uh, amount of information and when you look at how much parallel processing we do at the level of autonomic systems the mm. the amount of information we're processing is you know some some books I've studied say as much as ten billion 
bits of information a second out of which the ego selects 10 to 100. But somebody in magical consciousness without an ego uh, filtration system would be almost like somebody walking around on a couple of hits LSD all the time. They may Mm -hmm. not be high, so to speak, from the drug, but their sense of, you know, if a, if a, um, let's say an alligator was moving in the bushes, they would, without even looking, they would feel that moving inside of themselves as though something inside of them was moving. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? You know, that that reminds me of, of a number of different things. But when, uh, do you remember you came to London for the uh, Barefoot Connections Conference and there was a guy there called Louis Lieben, Liebenson? Yes. And he, he was one of the primary researchers into the... Uh, persistence hunt so the idea that you can chase down an animal and it will eventually overheat if you keep chasing and tracking and chasing and tracking through the the heat of the the midday sun yeah in an african couple, couple environment. of my environment couple of my clients have done persistence hunts they went oh, really yeah they went to africa and hired wow. hired a guy that specializes in working with the um i think the zulu tribe okay and uh my buddy uh, did that. They basically ran after animals for like a week mm. straight. <laughs> did they catch anything? Uh, I think they did. They were with the tribe and they, they did get yeah. us. Yes, they did. Uh, I mean, they themselves didn't because they were just not yeah. skilled enough hunters. But sure. my client had me putting them on training programs for about a year to get in good enough shape to be able to go out and run all day. You know, they're right. they're right. they're kind of at a – slightly faster than a jog to a jog pace that's it yeah. but you know they yeah. they got to run these animals till they drop so that's it uh, so if, they, if you run slightly above the trot gallop transition so in other words a, an animal will trot and it can it can separate its breathing out from from its gait cycle but the moment it starts to gallop it has to breathe one-to-one with its gait cycle yeah and that means that it can only uh go so fast and it can only cool down so fast because they tend to yeah they overheat and, yeah but, yeah but that's really both cool. of my both of my clients said uh, they won't be doing any more persistence hunting. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> it, um, it cured them of their evolutionary regression. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. But what I was going to say about it was one of the things that Louis talked about um, was that you know when you're in that state when you've been running for a long period you're starting to get fatigued. So he says you know it's it's the rhythm of the running, it's the exertion of the running, it's the pattern of the breathing. And it's the intense focus on your prey. He says the combination of those four things sends you into a trance state. And he says, you know, no matter where you look in the world, typically speaking, there'll be various different ceremonial practices to get people into the trance state. And normally it involves jumping and focusing on a fire or dancing, dancing yeah. around, you know, and singing, and ra- chanting, and rattling, drumming, repetition. Yeah. Breath work, you know, so it's all of those things and quite often a focus on one thing. It could be, uh, you know, a fire pit or it could be, uh, I don't know, like a, some kind of monument or, or whatever. But the point is, is that you stay focused. And he says, so the persistence hunt meets all of those characteristics. And one of the things that we know about the, the, the guys that still do the persistence hunting is that they say they get into this trance-like state and they can feel the movement of the animals. Because the, the point is that, you know, just like you were saying um, you know, when the ego is out of the way, you can feel uh, the animals or, or the environment and the animals within the environment around you. And so what Louis was saying was that, you know, of course, you, you get to this point where you've lost the deer. And if you start to panic and go, oh, oh no, I've been running for four hours and now I'm not going to get my dinner, you're going to lose it. But but the, the, the point is, is that you stop, you relax, and you get the sense for which way the animal went. And then you you feel the way the animal had moved from this this point where you last saw it, and off you go. And invariably, these guys are very successful with their with their hunts, and that's how they did it was by feeling the movement of the animal and feeling how fatigued it was. Even though, of course, you know you you're not uh, within eye shot of it, as it were. <laughs> you can't you can't see it. Um, but so yeah, you know, I think you know where we were going with those. Um, those questions, you could take it a step larger, you know, saying, well, what, what's the purpose of evolution? And um, I think that the concept of Leela uh, and the idea that really we're, that, that if, if God or 
the absolute. You mean or you, you, the, Lila, for those that don't know, means the dance or the yeah. or the play. It's sometimes interpreted as the dance of life or the dance of God. If you're uh, studying Hinduism, yeah, yeah. Then I think uh, you know, from a personal viewpoint, the, the 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 purpose of evolution is that it is God exploring God's self, Amen. Or source source energy exploring itself and and that is the game of it and that's why leela as, as a concept as a dance of life is perfect because uh, you know we're in this kind of illusion uh, it's illusory state um and the sense of separation and individuation and gradually what we're doing through our science is we're exposing the fact that actually <laughs> the big kind of cosmic joke is that we were in control all, all along <laughs> yeah. um, but not yeah. as individuals not as individuals yeah yeah but because the I mean, ego is creating the illusion of individuality but as you know you've heard me say this before but it's appropriate now when people used to go to saint francis of assisi and ask him how do i find god he would say what you are looking for is what's looking mm. And so mm. when you look at that, what's looking through Paul Check's eyes and using Paul Check's voice right now is also what's looking through Matthew Walden's eyes and using Matthew Walden's voice, but the ego creates the subject-object duality, mm. which is essential for consciousness, because if you have no subject-object duality, then there's nothing to be conscious of. You know, mm -hmm. if you are everything else then you're the baby shitting on your on your couch thinking it's your body. Yeah. So in order to have an experience, consciousness requires a subject-object split. And, you know, I agree with you. I, I think that the only way that whatever we call God or consciousness or source can experience itself is to um, create the illusion. And, and Arthur M. Young who wrote the reflexive universe and some other great books mm -hmm. um, and, and devoted his life to studying consciousness with the money he made from inventing the bell helicopter. He, um, he makes a great point that I think a lot of people have gotten confused over because the Hindu term Maya means the illusion. So if you study Vedanta, for example, a branch of Hinduism that, basically says it's all Maya, so don't get caught up in it, detach yourself from it, you know. Uh, and so you see them not wanting to do much. They just don't, they try to kind of not get caught up in anything and, and uh, you know, sp you know get, get rid of emotional attachments to things and, and sort of stand back with the concept, this is all a, an illusion, like it's, it's fake, it's just God having a dream. But Arthur M. Young mm -hmm. says, you have to understand this is the illusion. And so the analogy that Arthur Young gives, which I think is really good, he says, have you ever gone over to somebody's house and walked in when they were watching a movie and you got there halfway through the movie? Well, of course, we've all had that experience. And he says, well, you do you notice that you're having a really hard time following the illusion? We might call it the plot, but you're detached from the illusion only when you like if you're watching a whodunit murder mystery you need to watch the movie in detail from the beginning because any one little tiny clue could trigger you to having a precognition or an intuition about whodunit so he 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 makes the the key point that what we call maya or what is called maya in eastern philosophy isn't just an illusion it's the illusion and if god is is unconditional love or or mathematically a zero or is all in caps or is absolute as uh, even the christian religion suggests with the prefix omni then the only way god could experience god is to create an illusion and as i tell my students if god is unconditional love or pure potential that would equate to zero and then in order to create something to engage with, it would have to be a creation that's an expression from pure source, which would mean, let's call it a one, but it would have to be a virtual one. 
Yeah. Uh, an analogy I give is if our mothers were were uh, all zeros, then we would all be virtual ones. But the reality of it is, is that what whatever God is or what consciousness is dreams with enough intensity that it actually manifests its dream in in uh, in physical reality, which is what you know. I think we are talking about when we say life. And if you, yeah. all you got to do is look at quantum physics and they say, well, everything's coming from a zero point field, which is not empty. It's full and empty at the same time. So, so, you know, I just wanted to interject those clarifications and share a little bit of my perspective, but I, I agree with you. I, I, and I, I would love to hear more of where your storyline's going here. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, I know there's a risk of anthropomorphizing uh, God or, or making God seem like that sort of uh, traditional Caucasian guy in the sky with his grey beard and everything. But it's fu- if, funny, if we, funny how he's white, eh? Is is well, yeah. It always amazes me how. Sure it's funny. <laughs> I'm, I'm always amazed just to just to show you how we hack evolution and and the competitive concepts of Darwinism. How many yeah. times in your life have you seen Jesus painted up with brown skin? knowing that yeah. he is a Middle Eastern man versus an amazingly blonde-haired, white, Aryan Jesus on the wall. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, that, that's, that's called, not only is that competitive programming, but it is hacking and it is avoiding reality. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there was a meme that went around, uh, I think, Facebook or something, which was saying, where the fuck did Jesus find friends called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? <laughs> In Bethlehem or in Nazareth, you know. it's like how, how the hell did that happen? That's a good um, one. That's, anyway, that's, yeah, that's a good point. That's that's what we call very pointed, true humor. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, so um, and, and by the, if we, if we, by the way, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all wearing Nike Air Maxes, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, but so. You know, if we were to, if we were to try to, you know, it's easier for us to, to imagine God as a person. So, so if we were to do that um, and to, to say, well, you know, if this person is starting out with creating the universe, um, are they going to start with something extremely complex like a human being? Or are they going to start out with something extremely basic like uh, some building blocks, like some some atoms, and then build those gradually into, you know, what, what we see in chemistry, physics, chemistry, and biology. And so I I don't necessarily see a creative potential, um, whether that be, you could take it as intentional, or you could take it as through, you know, random chance, which is more the scientific view that all of this has kind of emerged just randomly and purely by chance. Um, But either way, the, 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 the process of evolution still fits from my perspective. I don't see why it would be, um, why they have to be mutually exclusive. So I think, you know, you could take any, anything like a, a car, for example, the earliest cars, the Model T Fords or whatever, and gradually across the last hundred years or so, they've got more and more complex and you've got more and more efficiency and more and more capability. And that that process that we've seen just in the last hundred years, I, I don't see why during evolutionary processes that would be um, inconceivable for that to manifest um, in the natural world as well. So where we get these these um, jumps in um, in uh, between species, and of course, you know, they always talk about the missing link for uh, for our own lineage. Um, then again, I don't necessarily see that as being um, incongruent with there being a, a more of a creative force. Um, and you know, one of the one of the concepts that we we sort of tapping into here as well is the notion of whether or not this is a simulation, whether or not we are actually simulated as human beings and our lives are simulated. And of course, there's several thinkers out there, including Elon Musk is, is one of them that uh, you know really supports this, this point of view. He says it's almost impossible that we're not simulated. Um, and there's also Yuval Noah Harari, who's written Sapiens and um, Homo Deus, Greg Braden, I think, talks about this as well. Um, but, but really, th- where we're going with the idea of simulation is that you know if, if we are simulated, then we're simulated by a being 
that is obviously more intelligent than we are at the minute. Uh, and that would mean that we would refer to that being or beings as godlike because they have created us. So that's, that's one way to look at it. Um, and when you look at the advances that we've gone through in the last just 40 or 50 years with computer technology and, and the way that kids are now playing uh, very realistic games that are moving into 3D reality and soon it'll be augmented reality and give it just another 15, 20 years, a lot of these people, Elon Musk is, is uh, obviously being a futurist, is um, very much thinking along these lines, as are the other guys I mentioned, that our realities will become indistinguishable, uh, our physical realities will become indistinguishable from our virtual realities. And so at that point, we have reached the point, essentially, of where actually, you know, if, if we can't distinguish between virtual reality and actual reality, then that's essentially what we're living in now. So, that, you know, he's saying that it doesn't take, or they're, they're all saying, it doesn't take that much more advanced technology for you to actually be essentially half bionic, uh, if not fully bionic, and and, and uh, indistinguishable from your virtual self. So, um, so that would that would point to the notion that we are actually already living in a simulation and that some other intelligent life form has created that simulation for us. So, um, so that's, that's a, a whole other rabbit hole you, we, we, we could dive down, but it's, uh, it's quite fascinating. What are your thoughts on it, Paul? Well, a couple of thoughts came up while you were talking. One, just to, to highlight how, you know, with the advance of technology and uh, you know, we've all, most of us have been to an IMAX 3D movie theater. And, you know, when a dinosaur jumps out of the screen at you, of course, everybody jumps back, right? But really, it's just a, uh, it, it just has to do with the way the projection is being interpreted by our senses. But when it comes to the concept of Maya, of whatever God is dreaming this into existence, I can I can cite something that mo I hope a lot of people have had the experience of, but have you ever had an orgasm in a dream? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, was that real or was that a virtual reality? Right, you might have been having sex with a woman, and where is she? Uh, how is that different than uh, being in one of those simulators? Because they, like you said, they'll get to the point where you can't tell whether you're in this reality or what we'll call a dream reality, which is some kind of a, a simulated projection. So mm -hmm. the yeah. psyche is already doing that. Uh, you know, uh, Jung said the psyche is not imaginary, it's imaginal, meaning that something that's imaginal is producing images and experiences that are as real as real can get. But to be imaginary would be to be imaginal. And then within like you and I sitting here, imagining a pink elephant in the room, that's imaginary. But the fact that we're here and that we breathe and we can have orgasms in dreams is imaginal because it's affecting us uh, physically, viscerally, that can be measured with biofeedback and real-time experiences. So, you know, I, I think that our own life experiences, if we study them very carefully, give us lots of clues to the deeper kind of hidden truths of what's going on. And one of the other things that came up while you were talking is, if God is God, then God's absolute, and there's no way you can create consciousness in an absolute reality without creating a duality, which requires yeah. relativity, or you can't have a subject-object split. So imagine if God is God, in caps, not a religious God, not my God versus your God, but the source of all those <laughs> imaginings, mm. uh, yeah. if you will, um, then... I have a question. How long would it take you as an absolute God to experience and explore your own contents so that you could become aware of what you were in a relative time frame? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that would be tricky. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the, I think the only answer is forever. <laughs> forever, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just keep going. Right? It's, it, because, yeah. and, and, and so when we look at the evolution of our planet, 4.3 billion years or whatever it is, something mm. like that, or we look yeah. at the Big Bang, you know, Itzhak Ventov made it clear a long time ago that what they call the Big Bang should be called another Big Bang for lots of very sound reasons that now is being well documented by science. So, you know, how much of what we're experiencing equates to how much God can experience? And there we get trapped in anthropomorphic thinking. And and then if God is absolute, which would only equal zero mathematically, which, by the way, is why scientists have to keep coming up with imaginary numbers, because every time they put zeros in their equations, it screws everything up. Um, so if if God is is zero, then what we're experiencing may be just a narrow slice of possibility. And it also means that if God is unconditional love for those that want to use that term, which the only numerical value we can give an unconditional is zero – which means no thing and everything, um, then I think the the concept that's being explored in, in various branches of theoretical physics, quantum physics of multiple universes becomes very, very real because mm. lo look at what we do in our own heads. We're driving down the road, piloting 4,000 pounds of steel, going 60 miles an hour, and we're dreaming about being somewhere else doing something else and we can do we can be driving down the road in a car and someone texts us or answer or calls us we answer the phone next thing you know we're having a serious rear end accident because we entered into another world that's so far removed from the physical world of the automobile driving on the street that now these two worlds essentially collide collide and and so you know, when I meditate on these things, which I do a lot, um, I've come to the conclusion that anything that you can conceive of is possible. You may not have the science or the technology to manifest it, but if you can be in multiple worlds throughout the day, then God can be in multiple worlds all the time. Whatever we can conceive of or do within the scope of our own perception and imagination ultimately is nothing compared to the absolute because anything that we're conceiving is it conceiving itself. Yeah. So I think, yeah. I think it's far more magical and mysterious than science uh, in general has wrapped its head around. I think to, to really get a better touch on the concept of evolution requires the kind of commitment that, that I have and people like you have, and that is to study the mystical traditions yeah. with honest intention to learn, not to say, oh, these people are idiots or this can't be true. But I mean, these are some of the most evolved human beings that ever walked the planet. In fact, I remember reading a, a, a book on quantum physics where they were quoting John Wheeler, the famous quantum physicist. And he mm. said, I'm paraphrasing. He said, at any moment now, I expect to find a Rishi, which is a wise man for those that you don't know, at the end of one of my mathematical equations, because he had found in his own studies of spiritual traditions, mystical traditions, and things like Taoist philosophy, and many of the great uh, quantum physicists have studied Taoism and, and the Tai Chi symbol and, and you know realized it was telling them everything they were researching. Um, Wolfgang Pauli was very into that. Um, and he had numerous meetings with Jung that have been recorded into books going into stuff like this. But the, the point that he was making is we're not actually discovering anything that hasn't been discovered many times over. We're just putting it into a mathematical language or a, a scientific language, but we're not really discovering this stuff. Mm. And, yeah. And I think, yeah. I think that, you know, when you look at, at, at science and issues of evolution and cosmology, it's gotten to the point now, look, you know, 
uh, the earth was once flat. Now we know it's round or some of us do. Um, you know, we, we used to never believe in a, uh, uh, that human beings would ever achieve the ability to, to, to fly with, with any form of technology. We fly all over the place. We didn't think we'd ever get to the moon. We did. Um, Newtonian physics was reached the point of hubris of thinking it had figured everything out in science and quantum physics turned it upside down. Uh, then we came to the realization of uh, the zero point field and quantum energy potential and scientists uh, still some of them hold the belief that quantum physics has nothing to do with the way we process or think. But then there's others that say, well, it has to have something to do with the way we think because you can't separate yourself from reality and quantum physics is the most advanced science with regard to accuracy and reproducibility when it comes to studying what is under underlying what we call reality. Well, that's it. It's the most fundamental as well, isn't it? It is. It's not just accurate, but it's the most fundamental. Yeah, yeah. So the point that I'm yeah. getting to is if you if you track the history of science, it changes its beliefs sometimes radically, even though it might take a while for the, you know, the 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 people that are holding on to old concepts to to up upgrade upgrade their software. But what what you ultimately come to the realization is that science is no different than religion. It just yeah. changes its belief system based on the instrumentation it's using. And the other thing that's often pointed out by people like Sheldrake is that science can only answer the questions it's asking, which is through the context it's looking into things. And then you look at quantum physics that says you cannot have a scientific experiment without a bias from the observer. So therefore we are part of every experiment. And if somebody's researching something like psi phenomenon that they don't believe in, the evidence shows very clearly they will get a null result. Yet when people have an open mind to it, or a good example of this is, um, is it Jock Benavista? That's the, the guy that did the original research on homeopathic medicine. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, I think it. I think that was him. But anyhow, right. he built. He did scientific. He was like the head of the French Academy of Science and highly respected. And 35 years, an esteemed scientist. And when he, his research showed that homeopathic medicine was real and you could produce medicines with not a single atom of the original source material that were many times stronger, well, the medical community or the medical scientific community just went crazy and produced all sorts of research saying nobody could reproduce the results, that he was bogus. He ended up losing his position in the Academy of Science. And it, you know, I've seen documentaries where they just showed how it just destroyed his life. He got so pissed off, he spent his own money and had a robotics firm build robots to do these experiments and ran the experiments over a thousand times. And every time it gave exactly the same results. So he showed if you get people out of the way who are anti-homeopathy and let a robot do the experiment, it will produce the same result every single time. And, you know, now homeop homeopathy is becoming more mainstream. But really, th wh what does this show? It shows that when people um, aren't scientific, I mean, scientific, science is the pursuit of truth. But mm. when people aren't scientific in their science and they start holding on to dogmas and belief systems, then you don't have science anymore. You now have dogma. And how is that any different than religion? Yeah. And, yeah, absolutely. So I have a couple of more questions here. Uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, you know, I study a lot of these um, ancient traditions and spiritual traditions and metaphysical uh, dialogues and discussions and books. And, and there's a number of great documentaries now. And, and there's, there's also, you know, I, I saw, I've, I've got a, a series of videos by Joseph Real, the, uh, if I remember yeah. right, he's a Pueblo holy man, but he's done the uh, sun dance four times where they dance for four days, 24 hours a day, nonstop, no food, no water, which is, almost like impossible to think of a human being being able to do when you think about that that would be like running multiple marathons back to back with no food and no water 
and you know he he talks about their spiritual evolution and how any of the dancers reaches the level where they don't need to to eat anymore they can um draw enough energy into their body from the oxygen and the atmosphere sunlight and the environment but he said he chose to eat because he enjoys the social act of it and and the experience of it but he was describing his father was a shaman and he was describing when he was young his father was doing a, a ceremony a procedure uh, teaching them and he said that his father literally walked right through the wall of their cabin they were living in and went out and picked herbs and brought them back and he brought these herbs back from a different dimension they weren't even local herbs they were from a, if i remember the story correctly they were from a different dimension but he put them in a bowl and and made a uh, made something out of them that they ingested and you know when you study some of these people like you don't have to have too many brain cells holding hands to see that a guy like Joseph Riel has zero interest in lying to people and telling stories. He is like about as true of a spiritual master and reliable human being as you could ever come across. And, and then, you know, I was raised in the self-realization fellowship and Yogananda was, was definitely not a guy that would, you know, tell people things that he did, didn't really believe from his own experience. So you start mm -hmm. talking to the, to, to paradoxically, you talk to the most highly developed human beings, far more developed than most of the people we call scientists. I mean, not even in the same ballpark. Yet people deny that these things are possible. And one of the things that has been discussed, there's many documentaries on, on Gaia TV, for example, talking about portals or vortexes at certain places on the earth where various shaman and cultures that had these abilities, and oftentimes this is things like what the Mayan calendar and other calendars were telling them, when the planetary alignments were right and the energies were right, and you could enter these vortexes and 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 literally uh, space travel or time travel, go into wormholes and things like that. Hmm. Uh, have you studied any of that stuff? And what's your opinion on that? I've I've only studied it to to some degree. You know, watch some of these uh, documentaries, and um, you know, first of all, it's it's fascinating because, like you say, these people uh, are not peddling anything uh you know at most they might have a book sometimes but you know the the, the point is that you, you get a real sense of authenticity from these people and the research that they're citing often is extremely credible you can go away you can look it up um and what they're doing is they're putting together information that is counter narrative it's it's, it's going against the the mainstream narrative and so you know, quite quite rightly, I think a lot of people will, will put their guard up a little bit and say, okay, well, you know, where's the evidence or, or, or you know, I'm not sure I believe that. But when you when you follow the trail uh, and, and look into what they've, um, what they've uncovered themselves, then generally speaking, I've, I've found it to be really uh, eye-opening and, you know, it, it makes sense to me that um, these notions of, of portals and uh, the ability to um, transition between dimensions. It's, it's all feasible from a physics perspective or from a quantum physics perspective. It totally is. Um, That's what a lot of people you know, don't it, realize. They think, oh, this, this is scientifically impossible. But look, mm. it doesn't take you long on YouTube to find scientists levitating things with sound or with vibration yeah. or – making things appear and disappear. I mean, the most, as, as David Bohm's and Carl Jung both said in their own way, mo thinking is real thinking is challenging. That's why most people just rearrange their prejudices. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's largely what happens is people don't actually investigate. They're too busy drinking their beer, eating their donuts and staring at junk television, but they, they come off as though they've got these expert opinions without any legitimate experience at things. And this is how, you know, real healing can be avoided and how shaman shamanic approaches to things can be downplayed and how vibrational yeah. medicine and homeopathy. I mean, look, how many people would have thought we would have a CAT scan a hundred years ago? I mean, or, or an MRI or a cell phone. I mean, you would have told someone like that a long time ago, 
But at the same time, you go back into the 1800s and you got, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, you got Tesla, you got Keeley, you got yeah. people doing things that if we would just use those technologies today instead of the government suppressing them, the whole world would change. We wouldn't have a greenhouse effect going on, I can tell you that. Not not at, yeah. not at least a human induced component of it. Yeah. Well that that just reminds me of Arthur C. Clarke's comment that any sufficiently uh, advanced technology is indistinguishable from from magic. And um, you know, I think uh, obviously the CTs and MRIs and that kind of thing uh, are examples of that. But um but yeah, I think it also links in quite closely, both with, you know, the paper that you and I recently wrote called The Ghost in the Machine is is musculoskeletal medicine lacking soul. Um where we, you know, we, we dug in, again, you touched on this earlier a little bit, we dug into to research showing that 74% of plant-based pharmacopoeia, so that, that means plant-based medicines that are used by doctors, um, they are derived from conversations with shamans yes. uh, that, that drug reps have, have had. They've gone into the Amazon or into Africa or Siberia, wherever, they thought that they may be able to access uh, indigenous medical knowledge, or they've spoken. To yeah, them. or they've taken their medicines and then broken them down in labs and reproduced them, and well, then that, and then synthesized. Well, that's them. exactly it. Yeah. That's exactly it, and that and that, that's what's what's happened is that they've they've taken the knowledge back to the labs. They've they've found isolated the uh, the active components and then made pharmaceuticals out of them, which is, which is, you know, you can understand how that process works. Yeah. It's not that it's right, it's but that's, you can, you can see how that's how business often works. It's quite cutthroat in that way. Um, it's reduction but, in science. Yeah. But, but, you know, what I think is, uh, again, what Bruce Lipton would, would uh, term a cosmic joke is the fact that, of course, the doctors that are prescribing it think that this is science. And what they don't realize is that the shamans identified which plants to use by talking with the plants. Exactly. <laughs> and it's just like, that's just hilarious that, you know, they, they won't consider shamanism or they won't consider even consciousness as something that could be yeah. outside of the body. Um, and, you know, again, this, I, that, that was something I was going to touch on as well as talking about consciousness itself. Um, Cause obviously we've talked about uh, the evolution, uh, you know, as, as a general concept, but the, and the evolution of consciousness. Um, but, you know, one of the things that, mainstream evolutionary approaches would consider is is the idea that consciousness is the result of evolution it's it's the result of neurons firing together and wiring together and this kind of thing but so much of the research that's out there you know f f ranging across a number of different disciplines but including things like remote viewing and psych psychokinesis and um uh, intuition, deja vu, ver various, you know, dream, dream studies, uh, dream research. It all suggests that the brain is not so much generating uh, information and not even just the brain, but, but that it's receiving information and it's a receiver of information. So I, I've always thought, you know, the, the phrase uh, neurons that fire together, wire together, and that, that is used to help reinforce behaviors or, or um, yeah. movement patterns or whatever. Um, but I, I think actually a better way to describe it is that neurons that receive together, weave together. Yes, I um, like that. Because, because if you think about it, it's a neural net, right? So it's a net that is capturing information. So it's like a goal, a goal net, you know, or fish nets or whatever. It's, it's, so those neurons, they, they perhaps um, you're fed a bit of information and the neurons capture that information. And now they're arranging themselves so that they can capture that information again from a broader um, information source, which would be the zero point field or, you know, it could be the Akashic records or, um, you know, however you want to describe yeah. it, it being in the ether as a thought form. But now your brain is, is uh, shaped to receive that. You've got a neural net ready to receive it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that, um, I picked up recently from a book that you recommended actually pause was, was the idea that, you know, the materialist view um, that we, that is the mainstream scientific view um, asserts that essentially things that we can't possibly know because, because we haven't experienced them. So for example, we assume that when we, when we weren't here, that 
the earth was here evolving without us and you know and there's we can use various rationale for that but we can't ever know that because we weren't here we yeah. can only make assumptions um whereas what we can know is that we experience consciousness and we experience uh emotions and so on and so forth um and so, so the materialist view asserts that that which has never been experienced so it is is real and it denies that that which has always experienced is real. <laughs> so in other words, it's kind of saying that consciousness itself is an artifact of the hardware, if you like, that's evolved. Yes. Whereas, you know, and so, and so, and so it's, it's, if, you, if you think of it in those terms, then, then what you realize is that um, it, it seems quite confused about where this consciousness is coming from. You know, because the consciousness has to be primary, because it's it's the only thing that you can know, uh, and that you have always experienced. Whenever there's an experience, it's because you have experienced it. I experienced this. We experienced that together. There's there's a a, a subject object interrelationship, but when there's just objects, you can't know that for sure. So you can't just say, oh, the the Earth was was uh was here. X billion years ago because the um, geology suggests it was. I mean, you can say that, but you don't know it for sure because you didn't experience it. Yes. So, you know, it's, it's a kind of fascinating, um, topsy-turvy situation we've got ourselves caught in. Um, and, it, you know, it ties in with our other discussions about consciousness being primary and being the thing that has um, driven evolution as opposed to evolution driving consciousness uh, i think that's an important um concept for for people to contemplate <laughs> yeah well I, I we've been at it for a while and um i'd like to to close with a, a comment you know we talked about darwin and the kind of competitive orientation of the theory of the survival of the fittest and and mm -hmm. and ultimately that produces what we now refer to as winners and losers. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was meditating on this the other day and my soul said to me, Paul, the truth is there's no such thing as winners and losers unless you believe that, which is dangerous for your own health, but mm. there is winners and learners. Mm. So mm. what we call losers in any game, sport or activity are the people that stand to gain the most from studying how the team that or the person that beat them did it, which enhances their ability to grow their skills in any arena. So yeah. I say, you know, when we're talking about concepts of evolution, consciousness, God, religion, philosophy, etc., it's people have this kind of binary. I agree, I don't agree on off, which is a, a low level of thinking. But yeah. I think if we accepted that human beings have had wild and amazing experiences, and even the greatest scientists are now acknowledging metaphysical teachings as holding truths that were clearly evident before science could measure them, and now is having to acknowledge that this isn't new information. If we switch from the you know, if you're a scientific materialist and you think people that believe the kind of things we're talking about are just morons, then you're sort of putting them in the losers uh, category. But if we say there are no losers, there's only learners, then we go from mm. saying, and this is where Ken Wilber's comment, there's a little bit of truth in everything. And, and there, there, we should all pay attention to that. And I, I say, let's all go from saying that the materialists are wrong or that the uh, religious people are wrong or that the scientists are wrong to saying, what can we learn from really opening ourselves to embracing that concept, not losing our own perspectives. But for example, when I study things like Christianity or fundamentalism, I listen to hours of lectures and read books that drive my my conscious mind nuts and even drive my 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 lady my my wives nuts because they're like hearing this 
fundamentalist Christian dogma blasting through the house. I'm like, why in the hell do you listen to that stuff? And I say, look, you know, about 60% of the world population is caught at this level of consciousness and it's causing them a lot of health problems. It's causing a lot of social problems. It's causing, causing a lot of world problems. And I feel compelled to recognize that if I want to help these people, I've got to study what I will classify as the disease of not growing up or waking up. And so, you know, I know you and I both have spent a lot of our life really looking at the opposing opinions view, whether we agree it or not. I think both of us have put a lot of effort into leaving space for the opportunity to learn something. And even if it, we don't agree with it, it might help us see our own theory in a different light or our own hypothesis in a different light or give us a new way of perceiving how they perceive so we can better understand them. So I say that the conclusion of our discussion on evolution is if we go from winners and losers to winners and learners and say, mm -hmm. who knows more than me? We'll call them the winners. What can I learn from them? Whether it be a mystic, whether it be uh, a, a teacher, a scientist, a uh, a housewife, a baker, an athlete. I think if we all embrace each other and put everything on the table and sift through the data and look for the patterns and the connections, that we will be able to solve a lot of the riddles that we need to pay attention to now before we enter into another reality that may not be nearly as nice as buying things on Amazon and going to the supermarket for something to eat. Mm, yeah, for sure. I agree. I agree. I really like that uh, winners and learners analogy. It fits very beautifully with the whole Czech model of the, the pain teacher and seeing pain as a, as a learning opportunity as opposed to uh, you know a punishment or uh, some kind of... Uh, thing that needs to be instantaneously gotten rid of um it's, it's it's the ability to learn and to evolve as an individual in an ontogenic way you know in your own development your own evolution as an individual um you know back to the discussion that we had earlier about evolution on the grand scale versus evolution as an individual and i think you know the winner and learner concept really highlights that idea of being able to evolve as an individual and um and use the pain teacher in that guise as well. So great way well, to round up. Yeah, lovely, Matt. And, you know, I, I personally, certainly, you know, things that I share on and my teachings, my, my podcasts, my blogs, they're the truth as I know it from my own experience and my own process and my own study. And, so I, I remain open to all possibilities and I certainly like if someone tries to convince me that there's no such thing as gravity, well, then I, I I'm not going to, you know, hang around and listen to the conversation long because it's just too obvious that that person's, you know, out of touch with the reality of gravity, so to speak. Mm. But, uh, and as you know, being a teacher, you get people that think they know lots about something and they don't have a clue what they're talking about, but they'll come at you tooth and nail like they're an expert. But as a general theme, I, I'm a very curious person and I have learned so much from other human beings. I've learned don't close the door just because something doesn't fit your own bias or your own um, dogma or your own belief uh, or you'll never learn anything. And I think that um, part of the reason that I'm doing these podcasts and, and, f and getting people like you on the show is to give it pers people a chance to look into the minds of other people, whether they agree or not, if it triggers off a creative process in you or it gives you a reason to ask yourself, is my own belief system really true or did I just be believe what was written on paper as though it was objective fact? then it's therapeutic. So thank you, Matt, for joining me today. And uh, where can people find more about your work, uh, your courses and things like that? Sure. Well, other um, than, I know you have plenty on the Czech Institute website as well. So those of you that are listening, there's Matt, Matt uh, has, is part of uh, online courses. He's one of the key instructors for the Czech Institute, but he also does a lot of neat stuff on his own. So Matt, go ahead and share where they can find that. 
Sure, yes, yeah, so you can find me on mattwalden.com. So that's pretty easy to find. It's Matt with two T's and Walden with two L's. And um, yeah, I've got you know a number of materials on there. And I, I also write for the Journal of Body Work and Movement Therapies. Um, so uh, if you're into more the research end of things and uh, you know like to, to explore that further, then that's on uh, PubMed and you'll find it uh, online just by searching my name, uh, under the Journal of Body Work and Movement Therapies. Well, thanks, Matt. It was a lovely exploration. And uh, Matt and I are planning on uh, doing one on the issues of diet. And uh, we will talk about evolutionary concepts and uh, all sorts of things like that. My tentative title for that podcast is The Honest Vegetarian. Mm. So uh, hopefully that piques your interest And uh, I look forward to sharing more with you, Matt. Lots of love. And uh, thanks for all the hard work you've done to study and share so much with the world. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. And uh, yeah, looking forward to doing more down the line. Amen. We'll we'll organize it soon. Big hug. Awesome. See you too. Bye-bye. Bye, bud. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Matthew Walden.